G'day, it's John from Superhouse Futures here, and today I have the brand new Sonoff T4EU1C. This little bad boy seems to defy the laws of physics. I want to figure out how it works, so we'll put it on the bench, look at the techs and the specs, and see if we can work it out. So let's go to the bench in three, two, one. Now before we look at how this little device works, it's important to understand what problem it's trying to solve. Typical domestic wiring for light starts at the switchboard and then has an active and a neutral that typically go through the ceiling space. Wherever a light and a switch need to be installed, the neutral is taken straight to one side of the light. Active comes down and goes to one side of the switch. The switched active then goes back up the wall and to the other side of the light. From here you can see it's a very simple circuit. Power just flows down through the switch, through the light and back to the switchboard. Then, at each location where lights need to be installed, this process is just repeated. So the active and neutral circuit just passes through the ceiling and meanders around between all the different lights. Let's simplify it though and just look at a single light to understand what's going on. Because the neutral just goes to one side of the light, coming down the wall we only have two actives. The active that comes down from the unswitched part of the circuit and the switched active that goes back out. That's fine for a normal passive light switch. But what if you want to replace your passive switch with an active switch? Something like a Sonoff Touch. Now an active switch has electronics in it, which means that it needs power. If you look at the back of a Sonoff Touch, it has active in and active out, just like a normal switch. But it also has neutral in. That's because it needs power to run its own electronics. These two connections, active in and neutral in, are vital for the switch to be able to function. So to install a Sonoff Touch, you have a problem. If you only have the two actives coming down through the wall, you don't have any way to power it. What you really need is neutral brought down as well. Now in modern wiring codes, this is usually done. In many countries, it's legally required now to install a neutral to each light switch location because it's quite common to need to install devices there, not just a passive switch. But if you have older wiring, this is probably what you have, just an active coming down to a switch location and heading back up the wall. Now at first glance, it may look like this problem can't be solved. We've got an active but no neutral, so how are we going to get power? It's like having a DC circuit where you have the positive and no negative, but there is a solution. Let's look at a simple DC example first. What I have here is a very simple circuit. We've got a battery which is giving us about 8 or 9 volts out. We've got positive coming through going to the switch. From the other side of the switch it goes through to this LED with a current limiting resistor, and then back to the battery. So it's a simple circuit with a switch in it. And if we flick the switch, you can see that the LED turns on. Now when the switch is turned off, no current is flowing in this circuit. But this is the trick question. In this circuit, where do you think the biggest potential voltage is? Well, let's have a look. The interesting thing is that if we chuck a multimeter across the back of the switch, when it, everything is turned off, there is no current flowing. Look at that. We get voltage across the switch. And the switch is turned off. Now the greatest potential voltage difference, apart from at the power source, is across the switch. So if we pick up power across the switch terminals, we can power something locally when the circuit is turned off and that switch is open. Now the thing is, you've probably come across this and used it yourself and never even realised. If you've used an illuminated doorbell, you know one of the buttons that lights up and you press it, the doorbell rings, and as you press it the light goes off. Think about what's going on there. What's happening is that the switch is an open circuit unless you press it. There is a light globe wired across the back of the switch. So when the switch is open, power goes through the globe and illuminates it. When you press the button, the globe goes out because the switch is short circuiting across it. And all the power is going through the switch instead of through the globe. So you might then be asking, well then, why isn't the doorbell going off continuously if power can flow through the globe? That's because the globe only allows a very small amount of current to pass. Another factor that many people forget is a traditional incandescent light globe is basically just a supersized resistor with a really high power rating. If we grab a multimeter and see what the resistance is across this particular globe, what have we got? 76 ohms. So this is basically a 50 watt 76 ohm resistor. On our circuit down here, taking the switch out, it's a very simple circuit just with the LED in it. 
what we can do is we can just put this light globe in series, pass power through it, and the LED lights up. The globe doesn't actually glow because it's not getting enough power, but it's just acting as a resistor in series with the circuit. We can pull a small amount of power through that light globe and it won't turn on. So now I've upped the ante with a main circuit with an extra little power supply hanging off here. What you can see is the active coming in to one side of the switch, going out the other side of the switch to the light globe. And then neutral comes back around and it just loops past. It's got nothing to do with the switch circuitry at all. That would just be normal, except that I've got this little switch mode power supply hanging off it. This is a power supply that takes mains input and it gives 5 volts output. I've just got an LED wired across the output so we can see when it's running. And that is wired across the switch. So now I've got to plug it in. I um, make sure everything is turned off most of the time. But what you can see now is the switch is off, the light is off, but the LED is on. That's because the power supply is taking power through the globe and across the switch terminals. Now it's kind of difficult to see because the globe lights it up. I'll put this here for shadow purposes. And if I turn on the switch, which turns on the light globe, you'll see that the LED fades out. That's as the output capacitors on this little voltage regulator uh, inside here uh, dissipate. And if I turn the light off, the power supply comes back on again. Turn the light on. And after a couple of seconds, the power supply fades out. But what you can see here is that we're getting power to run something at the switch location while the light is off. And we don't have a neutral to the switch location here. At the moment the neutral wire comes through, but it's not having anything to do with the direct switch. It could be any distance away in the house. So what we have here is actually getting pretty close to a system that would allow us to run a smart light switch with electronics running locally. The problem, of course, is what do you do when the load is turned on? How do you get power to run your local electronics? As you've seen in this example, when I turn the output on, we lose power because we effectively have a short circuit through the switch and there's no voltage potential across it, so we can't tap it off. Well, we'll get back to that later. It's actually easier than it sounds, but for now, Let's get into the actual T4EU1C and see what it's doing. I've wired up this on off and paired it with my phone, just in the usual way using the EWE Link software. Uh, that's not particularly interesting, so that's not what we're here to look at today. Um, the interesting thing is the wiring. You can see here we've got active coming in, going to the switch, active coming back out again, going to the light, and neutral just bypasses the switch entirely. In a normal situation, all of this cabling would be up inside the ceiling space. These two brown wires would come down through the wall and this switch would be located somewhere that it's handy to get to. But both of these wires are just the active going through to the load. And as expected, we can use the EOE link firmware to turn it on and off and I can use the touch to turn it on and off, stay synchronized does all the normal AOE link functions. It also comes with this little device, which they call an anti-flicker device. We'll look at that in just a second. I haven't bothered connecting it yet. That's meant to go across the load in some situations to prevent flickering, and it also helps to pass power through uh, with some types of load as well. But we'll get to that in just a moment. Because what we're really interested in is looking inside this device. We'll see what magic it's got hiding in there. Now, just like other uh, Sonoff Touch models, we can pull it apart by prising these little tabs open. Front cover comes off. And that is the main logic board. Let's prise this out and see what's behind it. Well, just like with the other Touch models, it's a two-part system. So we have the high-voltage part back here, and then this is logic. So we can see on here there's an inductor, uh, a diode, a couple of other things. That's probably the power supply for the 3.3 volt logic. And then there's a connector here, which goes through to the back board. And this is where the interesting stuff happens as far as no neutral is concerned. This front part is 
just a pretty standard control system. It's got the processor, the touch sensor, and um, voltage regulator. Let's take this apart and uh, see what is on the high voltage board. Now to learn more about this, we're going to have to chuck it under the microscope. Let's take a closer look. The low voltage logic board is very nicely laid out. It's pretty easy to follow. You can see the ESP8285 processor and its supporting circuitry. Just down the bottom is the programming header in the format that we're so familiar with. Up here is the LED that glows through the front panel and illuminates the little Wi-Fi logo. That's not actually the LED that illuminates the main part of the switch. That's inside the contact area just below it right here. This is the contact sensor which sits directly behind the acrylic faceplate. On the other side of the board directly behind it is the touch sensor IC. Now this is a Holtec touch sensor and it's actually pretty clever. It's a complete MCU with only six pins and it's designed to have two touch sensor inputs. You can see the via and the track that come through the middle of the board lead through resistor R12 and then into one of the touch inputs on the IC. This is needed because the ESP8285 doesn't have any touch sensing inputs. This IC takes care of it and then just delivers a logic output that shows when someone is touching the front of the switch. Now one of the first things I always look for on a Sonoff is where GPIO0 is connected. If you trace the pin off the processor down here you can see it comes up and then diagonally up and left and it ends in a via. That via goes through the PCB, comes out on the other side, right on the end of this resistor R10. That resistor is then connected to the output from the touch sensor IC. So what's happening is that the touch sensor is driving GPIO0 low when you touch the front panel. That's just like pressing the button on a normal Sonoff. So in this case, it works just like you would expect any normal Sonoff, except that it's a touch sensitive surface instead of a button. One of the interesting implications of this is that the point here where the yellow arrow is pointing is the only place on the entire PCB other than on the chip itself that you can pick up GPIO0. That means if you want to put it into bootloading mode, you need to connect something to this end of the resistor, which is really quite tiny. Another thing that's worth looking at is this 8-way header. This is what links the low voltage logic board to the higher voltage mains board that sits behind it. This header has three connections for ground and three connections for 12 volts in. This is 12 volts that comes from the high power board and it comes into this one. That then flows into that little voltage regulator just to the left of the connector and it produces 3.3 volts to run the logic and also provides that 3.3 volts back out through the connector to the board below. There's also the relay control output. This is how the ESP8285 drives the relay on the output. So the logic board in the Sonoff touch switch is actually really nicely designed. It's very elegant and it's pretty much all self-contained. You could power this up from some power supply and have yourself a nice little self-contained touch switch that you could run Tasmoda or whatever you like on it. But what we really want to see is what magic is going on in this mains board. The top side of the mains board includes the connector down in the corner which links through to the logic board that sits on top of it. You can also see the live in and live out connections here. Let's start by tracing the tracks on the bottom side of the PCB. You can see that a trace comes down from the live in and it goes into that TO252 package. It looks like a MOSFET or a TRIAC. The part number on it is an FTD04N04ND. And the only reference I could find to that was a Chinese website called rfchina.com. And the page doesn't even exist anymore. It's just a phantom sitting there in the search results. However, given the context, I'm pretty sure that this is a triac. It doesn't make sense for it to be anything else. From the other side of the triac, you can see that it goes across to the relay, and from the other relay terminal, does a bit of a dog leg around and ends up back at the live out connection. Now when both the relay and the triac have been activated, you can see that this makes a direct circuit between live in and live out. So when the triac and the relay are activated, whatever load is connected is going to be powered up. But what's going on here? There are a couple of parts that look like they are directly across the terminals. The black part on the left is a fuse, and the blue thing is a MOV. Now, a fuse is generally a closed circuit unless it blows. A MOV is normally pretty much an open circuit, and it acts to suppress transient noise. 
So ignoring the trike and the relay part of the circuit for now, what we have is a connection between live in and live out that is broken by the MOV. Now remember what we learned when we were looking at that light globe earlier. Effectively we have mains potential across the MOV. And looking at the other side of the PCB, where those MOV pins come through, you can see that we have mains potential between these two points. And following the traces down from there, they go into a bridge rectifier, and then the output of the bridge rectifier, positive and negative, comes down to this weird looking little 7 pin chip. It's like a SOP8, but one of the pins is missing. That chip is an LP3669, and I went digging and found its data sheet. It's a really clever little power supply management chip that uses feedback from the input in order to regulate the output. Now the only data sheet I could find for it is in Chinese, so I chucked it in Google Translate. And the summary says that it's a dual winding control chip for high performance isolated adapters and chargers, eliminating the need for auxiliary windings of a transformer and optimizing system cost. So basically it's a smart power supply. Now looking at the Chinese data sheet for this, we can see a couple of example circuits that look very much like what we've got on this PCB. You can see here the bridge rectifier, and it connects through to the chip, the LP3669. You can also see that there is a triple coil transformer. And as we'll see in a moment, what we have on the board is a triple coil transformer. And that then gives us the output voltage here, which can be used by other parts of the circuit. The reference schematic showed a three coil transformer. And if we look at this one on the board, and check the pins that come through the other side, you can see that yes, there are six pins, which means this is a three coil transformer. So what we've found so far on this mains PCB is how it controls the output using the relay and the triac, and a fairly nice power supply. And it's pretty easy to understand when the output is turned off, the relay is open, how the power supply gets its source of power. It's just tapping off the voltage between those two terminals. But what happens when the relay is closed and the triac is activated, which effectively shorts between the two live terminals and turns on the load? How does this get power? Well, hold on, things are about to get funky. The trickery starts right here. This is the gate for the triac, so this controls when it's turned on and off. If we follow that trace across, you can see it goes to a via. And that via pops up on the other side of the PCB, just over here. It then follows down the trace and ends on R14, and on the other side of R14 is a transistor. So that transistor is obviously used to turn the triac on and off. That means this particular SONOFF has independent control of the relay and of the triac, which are connected in series. I want to connect an oscilloscope up to this and see what's going on. So to do that, I'm going to solder a couple of wires on here. Just need some way to make a good connection. We found R14 just up here, so I'll solder a um, little jumper wire onto that. And we've already found down here on the connector that these bottom three are ground, which comes around to this pin. So I'm just going to solder onto that. And uh, that'll give us the connections that we need to be able to uh, connect the oscilloscope. So what I'm going to do now is wire this back together and uh, connect it up to mains. Now the mains here is disconnected, it's not live, I'm not silly enough to try connecting it while it is. So I'll just screw these in. And then I'm going to reconnect the logic board to the mains board. And this will return it to its normal operational state and it still has its original firmware on it. So if I power that up, it should operate as normal, but now we have connections for ground and the gate on the um, on that triac. So let's make some connections. This one is the ground connection. And this one is the gate. Connect up power. Making sure my hands are well clear. No smoke comes out, that's always a good sign. So now what we can see is that in its default state the voltage on that triac is zero. The triac is turned off, the relay is turned off. Now I'm going to turn the output on using the app and look what's happened. We've now got the load activated and the triac is being tripped at 50 Hertz. So what does that mean? 
Well, the relay is turned on at the moment. It's just hard on. It's not chattering. The triac, as we can see from the scope here, is actually flipping on and off 50 times a second. So what that means is that the light is continuously lit, but the power to it is being interrupted very briefly, and that generates potential across those connections. So even while this is running power to the load, it is very rapidly turning the output off, using that to generate power through the power supply, which is being stored in this big output capacitor, and then turning that triac back on so that the load can get its power. It's then coasting through that period, turning the triac off, charging up its output capacitor, and it just keeps doing that 50 times a second. So the result is that it's faking it. It looks like we're getting continuous power out, but it's actually turning it off very, very briefly, just enough to get the power that it needs to run its own electronics. And now if I turn the output back off, it doesn't need to keep flipping the triac. So the output is open circuit, which means that it's got full potential across those terminals, minus whatever drop there is in the load, and it just runs the power supply as normal. So you can see that we have a power supply that runs in two different modes. When the output is turned off, it's got the potential across those terminals, and it can just run as you would expect a power supply to run. And when the output is turned on, which means that the relay is closed, the triac is on, it's short-circuited, it's basically coasting on the power that it's got built up in that output capacitor and then periodically turning off the output to generate the potential that it needs to, to get some power, build the charge up in that capacitor again and keep right on going. Finally we come to the mysterious anti-flicker device. I haven't been using this so far in the demonstrations that I've shown you. So what is it? How does it work? Do you even need it? Let's start by opening it up and find out what's inside. What we have are just a couple of metal film capacitors. These are 450 volt rated, so mains rated caps. You can see there's a resistor in the middle. It is, what is it, brown, red, yellow. So that's a 120 kilo ohm resistor. It's pretty big, looks like 2 watts or so. And there's a thermistor on it. These are pretty commonly used for inrush protection in AC circuits. So, as we can see from the back of the board, these two capacitors and the resistor are wired in parallel, and then the thermistor is in series with it. So, what we've got basically is a couple of capacitors across the, um, the back of the load. So, if this is connected across the back of the light, what it will provide is a pathway for AC to pass uh, around the load itself. Now in an AC circuit, a capacitor effectively allows some current to pass. You can think of it as being equivalent to a resistor in a DC circuit. So what we can do is calculate how much power this will allow to pass across it. So what we need to do first is figure out what the capacitive reactance is. Now these two capacitors are 2 microfarads each, they're in parallel, that means it's effectively a 4 microfarad capacitor. So we can figure out uh, capacitive reactance, Xc is equal to uh, 1 over 2 times pi times the frequency times C. Now we know pi is 3.14159, we know frequency is 50 hertz, and we know it's 4 microfarads. So let's do some calculations. So we'll say 2 times pi times 50 hertz, times 3, 4, 5, so 4 microfarads, uh, and then 1 over x equals, so 795. So that's equal to 795 ohms, effectively. So putting this in an AC circuit at 50 hertz is like having an 800 ohm resistor in series with it. And from that we can calculate how much current is going to pass. So we know from, you know, just like normal DC Ohm's law, current is volts over capacitive reactance. So that is going to be equal to 240 volts. And we just figured out the capacitive reactance is 795 ohms. So what does that give us? Uh, 240 divided by 795 
equals 0 0.3. So what we've got is 0 0.3 amps that can pass through this at 50 hertz. So by putting this across the back of the load, it effectively means that 300 milliamps can pass directly around it, not going through the load itself. And uh, you might be wondering why that matters. Everything was working fine. Well, remember that with the example, I've just been using this old style incandescent globe, which is effectively a big resistor, as we've already seen. Power can go through it. And you can pull a bit of power through it without lighting up. It's not a problem. But what if you have a different type of lamp, something like one of these CFLs? Let's see what happens. Now here we've got the no neutral sun off touch connected up through the regular lamp. And if I touch this, it works as normal. Now if I take this lamp off, what's going to happen is this is going to lose power because there is no path through here anymore. And we'll plug in the CFL instead and see what happens. Don't know whether you can see that well on camera, but that is flickering. So if you're in a darkened room, this lamp would be continuously flickering even when it's turned off. But sometimes you get something even worse happening. Watch what happens here. Turn the sun off on and it turns itself off. Turn it on. I can't. It's because it's reset and it's resetting again. What's happening is that there is not enough power getting through the load to actually allow the sun off to run its own electronics. And uh, if there's not enough current flowing through the load, like if you've got a very efficient load, it won't be able to power up. By putting this across the connection, it'll allow some power to flow and this can keep running and it won't be passing that power through the load, making it flicker and also potentially making the sun off itself starve its power and turn off. Now I've connected that uh, anti-flicker unit across the globe and we can see that there is no more flicker. There is power on this now, the sun off is up and running. And if I turn it on, the lamp operates as normal and everything is fine. No flicker. Of course, there is now a small amount of power which is going to be passing through the anti-flicker unit in order to keep this alive. And that is one of the minor downsides of having to do this. What this is doing while the light is turned on is wasting power because up to 300 milliamps is going to be bypassing the light and flowing through the no flicker device. It's only a small amount of power, but it's using a little bit more than it would otherwise. So what I suggest is don't just put it on unless you know you need it. Uh, if you are using incandescent type globes, don't put on the anti flicker device and um, just test it out first. If it turns out you need it, then put it on. So if the capacitors are what allow power to pass through this, why does it have a resistor on there? That doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense in an AC circuit like this. Well, that's actually an indication that IT have done a really good job of thinking about ways that this system can fail. The thermistor for inrush protection is a good little uh, safety feature. Well, that resistor is there to protect you or your electrician. Imagine that these capacitors were charged up to mains voltage and this was disconnected. They could hold that charge for a long time. You could give yourself a really nasty shock across it. So what this resistor does is discharge the capacitors over time. Let's do a quick calculation and see how that would work. Now, um, discharge period on a capacitor is equal to resistance times the capacitor value. And so we know the resistance is 120,000 ohms, 120K. We got that from the color code. And we know that the capacitance in farads is 0 0.000004 farads. So let's work that out. We could say it is 120,000 times point. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 4 equals 0 0.48. So the time period equals 0.48 seconds. Now that is to discharge to 63% of, um, of the energy content. The discharge curve on a capacitor basically follows an asymptotic fall towards zero. And after about five time periods, it'll effectively be zero or close to it. And at 0.48 of a second per time period, it means at two and a half seconds, after you remove this connection, these capacitors will be well enough discharged that you won't get any shock from them.
So good thinking, uh, IT. Nice little safety feature to include in there. What a lot of people do is just put a capacitor across the load. They don't think about those extra safety issues. So that's really nice to see. And of course, the big question is, can we run Tasmoda firmware on this? Well, the good news is that if you get Tasmoda onto it, it works just like a Sonoff Basic. The GPIOs are all set up in the same way. So you just set the, uh, the basic profile and it works. The touch switch works because it's on GPIO zero, same as the, um, the switch on the basic. The bad news is that this is probably the hardest Sonoff that I have ever had to flash. Getting that image on there was really, really painful. And I would go so far as to say that if you don't have good magnification and you're not comfortable with reworking surface mount parts, this may not be the project for you. Part of the reason for that is if you open up the Sonoff, we've seen the, uh, the programming header on here, but as I've explained already, the only location that GPIO zero can be picked up is from the edge of a little 0201 resistor, which is mounted in here. And um, you can see on this one that I've actually butchered this one already. I've got a little blue hookup wire here and I've had to put a new surface mount resistor on. So if you're not comfortable with making connections onto these tiny little points, then you're probably not going to be able to achieve this. Now, I don't think that IT are necessarily being deliberately difficult with this. On previous on-offs, it's been possible to pick up GPIO zero and other important connections in reasonably easy to get places. On this particular board, it's really, really difficult. But there's an interesting observation to make out of that. Because GPIO zero is required to put the ESP8285 into bootloader mode, it means that they are almost certainly not programming them on the PCB. When an electronics manufacturer gets to a certain scale, what they can do is reflash chips in something like a zero insertion force holder or even have them pre-flashed by the manufacturer so that when they are flowed onto the PCB, the firmware is already on them ready to go. And the only explanation I can have for there being no access to the strapping pins on this board is if the MCUs are being pre-programmed. If you decide to give this a go, I highly recommend that you set up a serial terminal that is capable of doing an unusual board rate. You need 74,880 bits per second. That's because the ESP8285 outputs its booting debug information at that board rate, but most serial terminals can't do it. If you use CoolTerm, which is the one that I like, it runs on Linux, Mac and Windows, you can easily add that as a board rate. In the same directory as the cool term binary, all you have to do is make a text file and put 74880 in that text file and call it boardrate.ini. Next time cool term starts up, it'll look in its own directory for that file and it adds any board rates in it to the list. So now you can select 74,880 bits a second and you'll be able to see the debug information coming back from the processor. The programming header already gives us some of the connections we need, but we also need to pick up GPIO zero and reset. Now you might be wondering why I say reset, because normally what you do is put GPIO zero low and then connect the programmer which powers up the board. And if at power up, the, um, the processor sees GPIO zero as low, it goes into bootloader mode. But in my experimentation with this, I've had some trouble getting it into bootloader mode and I often have to try multiple times. So what I found is the most reliable is to hook up a wire to the reset line and put a button on it. That way I can start ESP tool running, attempting to connect to the board and then press the reset button and know that the board is going to be in bootloader mode. So to make that easier, what I've done is wired up a couple of buttons. So I'm going to use one for a GPIO zero and the other one for reset. The blue wire here, which is, just comes off the middle can go to ground. I'll take a red wire to reset, yellow wire to GPIO zero. So when it's all connected up, I can just hold down one button, press reset, let go, let go of the other, and we should be in bootloader mode. But getting the connections onto the board is the tricky bit. As you can see here under the microscope, I've already butchered this part of the board. This is the touch IC. And so I had to run a jumper wire around to pick up the other side of the PCB. And I've installed a new resistor here, which is in series with GPIO zero and the touch sensor IC. 
So what I'm going to do in order to connect onto GPIO zero is scrape back a little bit of the uh, solder mask that is on this track. Now this track on the microscope like this, it looks like a pretty decent size, but it's three tenths of a millimeter wide. So there's really not a whole lot of space here to be working with. So I'm just going to tin that track. Looking at this with the naked eye, it is just a tiny little thing like a human hair. And I also need to pick up reset and ground. So let me get a bit of focus here. Um, reset is this end of this resistor and ground is available conveniently in many places. I think I'll probably just take it off the end of this capacitor. Grab, it. Grab some tweezers to control the wire. I'll bring the blue wire in here and just tack it onto the end of that capacitor. Then I'll bring red in just over the top and tack it onto the end of this little resistor. And then just further across on the PCB here, I'm going to bring across the yellow wire so that we can assert GPIO zero. Now we have connections to the vital parts of the anatomy of this processor. So we can connect it up to the serial programming adapter. Now you can use your own cable as I've shown you how to make in the past or use one of these little adapters like I've got. Just make sure that you use a 3.3 volt um, USB to serial adapter because these boards can't take five volts. So what I can do now is connect this through here. It's um, powered up the board and it's ready to, um, to put it, be put into flash mode. But because I've got these buttons here now, to put it into um, bootloader mode, all I have to do is hold down the button connected to GPIO zero press the reset button, let go of it, let go of GPIO zero, and now we can run ESP tool and flash this board. And now this is where things get weird and have tripped up quite a few people that have tried to get Tasmoda running on this particular model of Sonoff. It can look like the flash has worked. ESP tool will report that it's writing the flash, gets to 100%, says that it's resetting the board, and then when you power cycle it or reset it, it doesn't come up, there's no Wi-Fi. It looks like it's booting, but it doesn't work. And what I've discovered by watching the debug messages from the, uh, the bootloader is that it seems to have some kind of a checksum problem. And the way around that that I found is to assert reset and GPIO zero after starting ESP tool. So what we're going to do is use ESP tool in the usual way. I'm going to load the sign off binary. I've started it. It's failing to connect at the moment because it's not properly in bootloader mode. So now I'm going to hold down GPIO zero, press reset, let go. And look, now it started the upload. And if you begin the upload using that particular process, using the two buttons that I've got wired to it, it seems to work. But particularly if you just have GPIO zero connected without the reset connection and you assert GPIO zero, apply power to the board, and then uh, try flashing that way. It can appear to work, but then fail. There we go, got 100% upload, and this should now be functional. Now, I'm pretty confident this has worked, so first thing I'm going to do is remove the um, these buttons. I've just got to drop these little wires off where I've um, attached them, and then I can put it all back in its case. So this is the main part of the board here. Oop, the blue tack holding it on. And so I've just got to clip it back into place. And also it's worth mentioning that uh, while you're doing this reflashing, it's easiest just to have the logic board separated. Definitely don't have any mains connected, but if you don't even have the backboard connected, it's even easier. So now I can just clip all this back together and connect up my mains. Now, I've already been through the process of setting this up. All the configuration is in place. 
it's got MQTT configured in Tasmoda, so it's logged into my MQTT broker and it's all ready to go. So it works as normal, just like a Sonoff Basic. And um, on my phone, I can use that to control it as well. So this is using Node Red, which is just publishing to MQTT. And you can see that it's all working fine with Tasmoda on it. The um, LED is illuminating correctly to show when it's on. The button works. The network works, it's on Wi-Fi, everything is functional. So you see, you can get Tasmoda onto these, as long as you follow that sequence. If you just hold GPIO 0 low when you apply power through the programmer, it's not really going to go into bootloader mode properly. Now, I don't know what the reason is. There's something weird about these particular boards, and it's not just me that's had problem with it. Many other people have as well. Uh, but if you connect to the reset connection, and also to uh, GPIO 0, then you can do this. Now, finding those on the board is a little tricky. So on the Superhouse website, I'm going to have nice pictures that show you exactly where all those connections are so that you can follow along yourself. And um, also, make sure you jump on the Superhouse Discord. There are more than 500 people on it now. It's a great place to talk about home automation topics, DIY projects. So. If you have a domestic wiring situation where you don't have neutral availability light switches and you want to retrofit, um, the T4EU1C does seem like a pretty good option. In terms of its engineering quality, it's certainly as good as I could possibly expect. IT have done a very good job of making sure that this is as safe as they can make it and um, it seems to work very nicely. It would be nice if they had brought out GPIO zero and reset onto nice pads where we could access them easily. But if you can use uh, a microscope or magnification and get connections onto those, then you can get Tasmoda onto this and have total control of your no neutral Sonoff Touch T4 EU1C. So thanks for watching. Now go and build something cool. Well, that resistor is there protect to... Blah.